In the Simpson case, God, if there is a God, not only permitted the butchery of Ron and Nicole, but seemed to be working overtime to ensure that the killer, Simpson, would get off, that justice would be thwarted. If anyone was ever in the corner of a murderer, it was God with Simpson. He didn't just permit an atrocity to be committed. He seemed to be conspiring to see that Simpson walked out of court a free man, and with a smile on his face, Simpson getting every conceivable break imaginable from beginning to end. And apparently, Simpson knew. On the night of the not guilty verdict, Simpson, at his victory party, smiled broadly and held up a Bible in his outstretched hand. This from the October 4th, 1995 edition of the Los Angeles Times. O.J. is free and God deserves the thanks. That was the message delivered with unbridled cheer and relief that came pouring forth from the Simpson family Tuesday as his celebrated trial came to a climactic close. God is good, see, said Tracy Baker, O.J.'s niece. I know that praying to God is the answer, Simpson's mother Eunice said. Me and my family want to thank God, without whom I don't know where we'd be, said Simpson's son, Jason. Simpson's daughter, Arnell, said to her brother in the courtroom when the jury returned its verdict, We did it, Jason. God got us through. And the very first words defense attorney Johnny Cochran used in his post-verdict news conference were, I want to thank God. When it comes to theology, I am too confused to be anything but an agnostic. But if there is a God, as there may very well be, the deist philosophy, which holds that after creating the universe, God bailed out, indifferent to that which he created, would seem to do less violence to the accepted principles of logic and common sense. At least the deist philosophy is free of inherent contradictions. When one writes about God and religion, one deals with millenniums, not years, frequently not even centuries. For instance, the New Testament and Jesus go back more than 2,000 years. When we get into the Old Testament and Genesis, we're dealing with years without number. With this in mind, and though it is not a parallel, I hope you, the listener, will not mind my briefly going back just 15 years to what I wrote in a short section on agnosticism in the epilogue of my book, Outrage, The Five Reasons Why O.J. Simpson Got Away with Murder. I herein present excerpts from it, as a prelude to this book on the subject. God, where are you? When tragedies like the murders of Nicole Simpson and Ronald Goldman occur, they get one to thinking about the notion of God. Nicole was only 35, Ron just 25, both outgoing, friendly, well-liked young people who had a zest for life. Their lives were brutally extinguished by a cold-blooded murderer. How does God, if there is a God, permit such a horrendous and terrible act to occur, along with the countless other unspeakable atrocities committed by man against his fellow man throughout history? And how could God, all good and all just according to Christian theology, permit the person who murdered Ron and Nicole to go free, holding up a Bible in his hand at that? When Judge Ito's clerk, Deidre Robertson, read the jury's not guilty verdict, Nicole's mother whispered, God, where are you? I said earlier, if there is a God, because although there are good arguments for the existence of God, for example, the cosmological one, that is, the first cause theory, and the teleological, which takes as its starting point the observed order in the universe, in my own little mind, I, for one, can't be sure at all there is a God. There ain't no answer. There ain't going to be any answer. There never has been an answer. That's the answer. Gertrude Stein Can you understand the mysteries surrounding God? They are higher than the heavens and deeper than the netherworld. So what can you do when you know so little and these mysteries outreach the earth and the ocean? Job Chapter 11, 
verses 7 through 9. Since the dawn of recorded time, human beings throughout the world have looked to the heavens for help in their daily lives and eternal life after death. These people who sought the intervention of an invisible being with supernatural powers eventually became known as theists, those who believe in God. Two other much smaller groups emerged, atheists, who believed no such being greater than man exists, and agnostics, who scratched their heads and took no position. Although in the vernacular agnostics are those whose position is, I don't know whether God exists, neither believing nor disbelieving in a deity, it is thought that the better definition of an agnostic is one who believes that the existence versus non-existence of God is unknowable. Of course, if it's unknowable, one can't know. From an historical perspective, the word agnostic is of relatively recent origin, but the date of the word's first usage by its creator, British biologist Thomas H. Huxley, is not clear. In his 1889 essay, Agnosticism, Huxley speaks of the word agnostic coming into his head as the antithetic to the Gnostic of church history. Huxley goes on to say that he used the term at the earliest opportunity he had before the English Metaphysical Society, of which he was a member, but he doesn't say when that was. However, a January 1870 article, Pope Huxley, published in the British magazine Spectator, referred to Huxley as a severe agnostic, so his appearance before the Metaphysical Society had to have been before January of 1870, most historians settling on the year 1869. Though the word is not old, obviously the notion of agnosticism goes back centuries. Huxley himself, in his 1878 book, Hume, with helps to the study of Berkeley, called Socrates the first agnostic. Perhaps the first known written discussion of agnosticism was by 5th century B.C. Greek sophist and philosopher Protagoras, who wrote in his essay on the gods, Concerning the gods, I have no means of knowing whether they exist or not, or of what sort they may be. Many things prevent knowledge, including the obscurity of the subject and the brevity of human life. Perhaps no person has been quoted more on his beliefs with respect to the existence or non-existence of God than Albert Einstein. And, whether deliberately or not, the great physicist's many words on the subject throughout the years have given fodder to theists, atheists, and agnostics in claiming Einstein as one of their own. But the only time I'm aware of that he chose to actually use one of these appellations to describe himself was in a letter to one M. Berkowitz, dated October 25, 1950, just five years before his death, in which he wrote, My position concerning God is that of an agnostic. When one writes about God and religion, one deals with millenniums, not years, frequently not even centuries. For instance, the New Testament and Jesus go back more than 2,000 years. When we get into the Old Testament and Genesis, we're dealing with years without number. With this in mind, and though it is not a parallel, I hope you, the listener, will not mind my briefly going back just 15 years to what I wrote in a short section on agnosticism in the epilogue of my book, Outrage, The Five Reasons Why O.J. Simpson Got Away with Murder. I herein present excerpts from it as a prelude to this book on the subject. God, where are you? When tragedies like the murders of Nicole Simpson and Ronald Goldman occur, they get one to thinking about the notion of God. Nicole was only 35, Ron just 25, both outgoing, friendly, well-liked young people who had a zest for life. Their lives were brutally extinguished by a cold-blooded murderer. How does God, if there is a God, permit such a horrendous and terrible act to occur, along with the countless other unspeakable atrocities committed by man against his fellow man throughout history? And how could God, all good and all just according to Christian theology, 
permit the person who murdered Ron and Nicole to go free, holding up a Bible in his hand at that. When Judge Ito's clerk, Deidre Robertson, read the jury's not guilty verdict, Nicole's mother whispered, God, where are you? I even have trouble with the whole concept of prayer, in which literally billions of people throughout history have begged God for mercy. But since God is supposed to be all good and merciful, why would we have to beg Him to be what He supposedly already is? We, of course, always hear people saying, God answered my prayers. But I know that those who say this do not realize the import of what they are saying, because if they did, they wouldn't think very much of God, which they do. Saying that God answered my prayers necessarily means two things, that God has the power to answer prayers, and more important, for the 99% of the other humans who pray and beg for God's merciful intervention in time of desperate need, God told them to take a walk, get lost. He couldn't care less. He said no. God answered my prayers necessarily and inevitably means he chose to disregard the prayers of others who were begging for mercy or compassion in their lives. In fact, the vast majority of others. We have proof throughout history that if God is sitting up there deciding who gets mercy, he rejects the plea most of the time. Don't you think people pray to be spared when they have terminal cancer? Don't you think the Jews at Auschwitz prayed to God to be spared? When President Kennedy was blasted into eternity by Lee Harvey Oswald on November 22, 1963, again some preachers said, It was God's will. The evangelist John R. Rice wrote, The assassin's bullet which cut down President Kennedy did the will of God. God has his reasons, we are told, for permitting all these atrocities. As the Reverend Rice wrote, it was a matter of his choice. He had reasons for permitting the assassination of President Kennedy. And of course, the unquestioned assumption is that whatever the reasons, they are good ones, reasons that justify what he did or permitted to happen. So, even though he wanted these horrors to occur, he is still all good. No matter what happens, murder, famine, genocide, deadly plagues, etc., don't question God. He has his reasons, and they're all good. But my question is, if a good and powerful God doesn't prevent evil, why should we automatically assume that there's a good reason for the evil? Who tells us that when it comes to God, we must reject all conventional notions of logic and common sense and assume there is a valid and satisfactory reason for all the horrors and tragedies and misery in the world? It would seem that the only justification we would ever have for taking that position would be if God, appearing in the sky, told us that although what has happened doesn't make sense to us mortals, it is part of a grand scheme he has for life in the universe. Wouldn't that be the only possible sufficient cause for our belief that despite his willing and permitting the horrors of life, he's still all good? Apart from God's apparition in the sky telling us this, what human being can possibly convince us of this absurdity? The myth in Christianity that God is all good, all knowing, and all powerful is so ingrained in our history, civilization, and culture that it may persist no matter how much our civilization progresses. Imprinted on all of our coins and all of our currency are the words, In God We Trust. But why? What has God done to earn this trust? Won't someone please tell me? I know it is said that there are always 10% who don't get the word. Maybe I'm in that 10%. No one, but no one, even the tyrants of history, ever badmouths God, even though he supposedly permits all the evil in the world to exist. In the Simpson case, God, if there is a God, not only permitted the butchery of Ron and Nicole, 
but seemed to be working overtime to ensure that the killer, Simpson, would get off, that justice would be thwarted. If anyone was ever in the corner of a murderer, it was God with Simpson. He didn't just permit an atrocity to be committed. He seemed to be conspiring to see that Simpson walked out of court a free man, and with a smile on his face, Simpson getting every conceivable break imaginable from beginning to end, and apparently Simpson knew. On the night of the not guilty verdict, Simpson, at his victory party, smiled broadly and held up a Bible in his outstretched hand. This from the October 4th, 1995 edition of the Los Angeles Times. O.J. is free and God deserves the thanks. That was the message, delivered with unbridled cheer and relief, that came pouring forth from the Simpson family Tuesday as his celebrated trial came to a climactic close. God is good, see, said Tracy Baker, O.J.'s niece. I know that praying to God is the answer, Simpson's mother Eunice said. Me and my family want to thank God, without whom I don't know where we'd be, said Simpson's son, Jason. Simpson's daughter, Arnell, said to her brother in the courtroom when the jury returned its verdict, We did it, Jason. God got us through. And the very first words defense attorney Johnny Cochran used in his post-verdict news conference were, I want to thank God.